Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. I'm your host, Bo, and today we have Henry Post, Capital Markets Director at Equity Multiple. Equity Multiple is a leading CRE private equity and bridge lending firm with over 400 million in historical investment volume across investments totaling 3.7 billion in aggregate value. So they really have a lot of solutions. So welcome to the show. It's going to be exciting to talk about, you know, putting these types of deals together and what you're seeing in the market and so forth. And uh, welcome from uh, you're in beautiful Nashville today. So that's a great, great place to be. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Uh, that, that market there is pretty insane too, isn't it? Like just total growth right now. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're seeing. Um, you know, same sort of thing as Austin, where uh, the, the the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. I think um, it's probably overbid in a, in a pretty substantial way on a lot of the higher quality multifamily stuff. But um, there's also a lot of uh, very local players, so um, you know, it's it's still small in that regard. So I think there's some 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 opportunity if you got some boots on the ground. Can you give us a little background on Equity Multiple? Um, you know, how it started and and what's the plans for the future with the company? Absolutely. Uh, so Equity Multiple has been around since uh, September of 2015, so we're coming up on the seven-year mark here. Um, uh, you know, broadly speaking, it falls under the umbrella of, of real estate crowdfunding, um, and that's still true today. And that most of our, uh, our, our 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 primary capital sources are is our retail accredited investor base. I think we're up to about 37,000 or so. Um, and, uh, you know, back, uh, back in our early days, um, you know, it was sort of the advent of real estate crowdfunding and yeah, the jobs act, you know, pop or, uh, the, the updates kind of, uh, came through officially in late t- 2012. And that's when, um, you know, us and some of our contemporaries really kind of started to, to try and understand the regulatory environment and, um, and roll something out that was a little bit more accessible, I think, to, to traditional kind of retail accredited investors. So our first couple of deals were, you know, in the four hundred thousand dollar, five hundred thousand dollar range, and um, you know, it was it was very weird uh, going out and raising money online and giving it to strangers for these private real estate deals. But um, I think it's sort of, or I'm not, not I think it, it certainly has started to gain quite a bit of traction. And, um, you know, the the days of uh, four hundred thousand dollar checks are, are are long gone. Um, you know, these days we're writing checks between four and twenty million. Uh, as you mentioned, um, anything from uh, senior bridge lending all the way up to co-GP equity will also structure um, investments in specific funds if we like the funds investment thesis. Um, and uh, frankly, it's, it's, it's been really great. We're up to about 40 people um, at the company or, or maybe it's closer to 50 these days. Um, and that's you know, spread across a, a kind of high octane um, kind of real estate, private equity and, and, and lending team. We have in-house investor relations that deals with our uh, retail and credited investors. Uh, we've got marketing. We also built our, our web app from the ground up. So we've got a good team of, of software developers in place and, and, and engineers. Um, so yeah, we're out for our series B round of funding right now. It's, a, it's, it's an exciting time to be involved. That's awesome. Can you walk us through maybe a couple of your recent deals that the company's done and like, you know, like the position that you came in and the capital stack and, and how these deals came to be? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. I'll, um, I guess, a synopsis of, of 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 the gamut would be helpful. So we just closed on the nice little senior debt deal that was um, a seven million dollar bridge loan, about seventy percent of cost, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, last mile industrial in Enfield, Connecticut. Um, you know, kind of sort of the tri-state area in Boston. Um, great little deal. Uh, it was the, the the rents in place were significantly below market. There's um, you know one vacant space, and the uh, sponsor already had a lease in hand that was signed at market rates. Um, you know, going in coverage uh, was was uh, well in excess of, of of the debt service. So, um, you know, that one was was a pretty straightforward senior debt deal. Um, really, really not a whole lot of uh, nuance to report there, but uh, certainly the kind of stuff that we want to be doing more of because boring is definitely good when when you're a senior lender. What 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 is it? Are you guys usually like an adjustable floating type of rate uh, on these type of deals? Um, yeah, it it, it depends. Um, if if it's like the higher rate stuff, um, you know, we just kind of assume that floating rate risk ourselves and say, listen, you know, if if, if we're getting um, an eight percent coupon, we can we can eat the uh, you know forward curve two percent variable risk, right? Um, if, if we're getting a little bit more competitive on on rate, we might try and factor in a a, a floating rate over spread. And so on, on some of these like bridge deals, do you oftentimes like you'll put your 70 or 80 percent leverage on and then because you have investors that have different um, risk tolerances, can then you can you stack on like a B piece of that so you can go up to even higher leverage where they'll take 
a little bit more risk, but they'll get a little bit better returns. Is that how you guys are really geared? Good question. Um, so the short answer is yes, that's, that's exactly what we're thinking. Um, and we can do it a couple of ways, right? Like we can either do what you just suggested where there's like an A note and a B note and the A note could have, you know, like a, a, a let's call it like a 50% of cost and the NDSCR north of two and a half. And it's just super low, um, you know, super low risk and maybe a 5% rate. And that would allow the B note to be closer to, um, you know, 10% rate. You know, what we're sort of finding is that, or not finding, what, what we found over the course of the last seven years or so is that our investors tend to look at us as a proxy for investing in more traditional securities markets. Um, and for better or for worse, uh, they seem to feel that the number to beat is roughly 7%. Um, and it has to beat it, you know, I would say at least by a percentage point because, um, you know, for that's sort of the uh, trade off for the lack of liquidity that you get with us, right? Like you're tied up for the two, for, for, for the full kind of one or two year term for, for, for these senior loans. So we found that 8% is just sort of the rock bottom number um, that we can offer in order for it to be appealing to retail investors. Um, you know, we're experimenting, as I mentioned, with that lower rate stuff and seeing what the response is. But, um, you know, we also are in conversations with uh, plenty of other kind of credit line or A-note buyers, things like that, just to sort of take on that, that uh, A tranche um, on our behalf. And, you know, it seems like uh, two different ways to get to roughly the same place. Got it. Got it. So th it just really kind of depends on the deal, how it gets structured. Every deal is unique, obviously. Uh, it sounds like you have a pretty broad appetite on uh, asset classes, as long as they're kind of cash flowing asset classes. You're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Hi, Bo Eckstein here, and I want to thank you for being a, a patron of this YouTube channel, or if you're listening on iTunes, Stitcher, or any of those audio platforms, I want to give you my book for free that I just wrote. It's called Launch, Expand, or Buy Your Next Business Using SBA Financing. And you can simply go to thesbabook.com, and you can receive a free copy of my book. That's the SBA book.com and thanks so much for being a valuable listener or viewer of the show and I hope you enjoy the book it's a very short book it goes into detail uh, you can read it very quickly and get a good good overview of all the benefits of using SBA financing so thanks so much and I'll see you soon we're um, now your the company is it a privately owned company or is it a uh, uh, is it a public company? Um, privately owned, and uh, I would say still uh, kind of on the later stages of the startup side of things. Um, you know, we've got as I mentioned about fifty employees. We're out for our Series B round of funding right now. Um, it was started by our our um, CEO and CIO. Our, our CEO Charles Clinton has a, a pretty extensive background in real estate and securities law. Um, he worked uh, worked on an account with Blackstone for a very long time. Um, and then our CIO uh, has an institutional real estate background, uh, worked at Lehman Brothers uh, in the real estate credit department um, with Brickman. Um, very, very sharp fellows. Uh, but uh, yeah, they're, they're um, kind of leading the charge for us. Okay, got it. That's great. And, and where, where were you before this company? What, what, what was your background? Um, so before this, uh, I jumped on board with Cushman and Wakefield in my early 20s. And I worked for a fellow named James Nelson out of New York City. Um, it's the kind of quick background there. So there, there used to be this company called Massey Knackle in New York city, and they uh, basically just dominated the investment sales market, anything from five to a hundred million. Like they were the ones doing it. So as they like to do, Cushman came in and just bought the company. Um, and so, you know, there were, uh, I think four or five partners at the time, one of which was, was my boss, um, James Nelson. And, um, you know, they all had their three, four year contracts. And once those expired, everyone kind of scattered to the breeze. So, James went from uh, Cushman to Abison Young to start their tri-state investment sales platform. And I went over there with him. Um, and then from there, he, uh, he, he asked me and, and another uh, gentleman to kind of build out a nationwide kind of net lease retail platform to deal with all of his 1031 business. You know, you would have these, you know, mom and pop owners in the East Village that have owned this forever. And they just didn't want to deal with the Department of Finance in New York State anymore. And so you just pitch them into a net lease retail asset and everyone was, was happier for it. So that was a, that was a good little business for a while. And then I joined Equity Multiple uh, about three years ago. Very good. And, and where do you think you guys right now are the most competitive in the space? 
Ooh, that's a good. Um, relative to other crowdfunding platforms, or uh, in general, I mean, in general, like um, you know, why do you think you're getting the opportunities? Where you're getting the opportunities? I mean, there's there's a lot of lenders out there. There's you know, Mez, you know, pref, uh, pref Equity. Why do you think you you guys are growing the way you are? Where do you think you're competitive? And like, that's why people are working with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll I'll try and keep this from 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 sounding like a billboard. But um, you know, we yeah, you know, everyone or not 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 everyone, but quite a few sponsors, borrowers. Everyone's sort of interested in in crowdfunding as a capital source. Uh, but that comes with some caveats, right? Um, you know, first of all, not everyone necessarily wants exposure to retail investors. Um, and not everyone feels comfortable about, you know, what, what we call the kind of best efforts risk that you run into a lot in crowdfunding where, you know, um, some of our contemporaries might say is like, well, you know, we're going to target this, but if demand comes in, you know, at some lower amount, you got to find a way to bridge the gap because we can't do it. So, um, you know, we've gotten around both of those concerns. We have, uh, you know, buckets of kind of discretionary capital that we can use to commit to and, and close transactions. And then we can kind of continue to syndicate and raise post close. So we've, we've um, mitigated the kind of best efforts risk. Um, and then similarly, the, the, the way that we structure our investments is not crowdfunding in the conventional sense where all of our investors will invest directly with a sponsor by signing their subscription agreements or, or whatever. Um, you know, typically we'll have all of our investors invest into an LLC or an SPV that we're the managing member of. Um, you know, typically we'll issue 506B securities um, in those LLCs. So it's like a little mini IPO in our, in our entity every time. And then that entity, whether it's like the JV equity kind of vehicle or the lending vehicle, um, that's what kind of invests into the deal itself. So you have a nice layer of separation. Sponsors are dealing directly with us, with our institutional asset management team. They have one point of contact. It's one K-1 come tax season. It's one quarterly report. It's all very straightforward. And then our investor relations team will handle all of our investors um, and, and, and their questions about specific deals and K-1s and, and, and things of that nature. Mm, very interesting. Um, so like a, a sponsor who's going out and raising their own LP funding, they, there, there might be a reason to come to you because they could go and maybe get a $10 million check versus going and getting, raising the capital themselves, right? Like uh, on, on that yeah. side of the equation, I'm just thinking a lot of my colleagues are, yeah, and friends are, you know, pretty, pretty large multifamily syndicators. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering where the, where the value you know, comes in for, 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 the, for them, like with your company, for example, like, you know, take the burden of having to raise money. There's, you've got a crew and it's, it seems like the, there's no difference in raising themselves other than it's probably a little, might cost a little bit more for them from a return standpoint, but you're bringing, instead of bringing 500,000, 400,000, you're bringing a check for 5 million or whatever. Right. And that's the real difference. Yeah, I, I would I would say the, the the bumper sticker version is probably um, you know it's it's a very much a real estate kind of private equity process and format um, in conjunction with the fact that you get access to the world of retail accredited investors, so you kind of get kind of get the best of both. Yeah, that that that's good. That's good. So a lot of times, are you are you starting to see more sponsors now? Like just realize like, hey, let's just go this route just because the ease of you know instead of them having to make be on the phone calling their all their investors to do a, a partial raise um what what on on those type of deals when you're 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 bringing in lp and so you're going to be essentially almost like a you guys create the fund and the fund invest as an lp in the transaction what do you how do you vet the the sponsors on those type of deals and, and what do you what do you like to see do you still want the sponsor to be raising 20% or 10% of the, you know, the, the, the equity to close. What, 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 what does that typically look like on a structure? Uh, yeah, I would say par for the course is, you know, roughly 12 and a half to 20% sponsor or GP contribution. Uh, you know, the, the, the reality of the situation these days is that very often that's, uh, that there's a portion of that that's syndicated. So we'll ask for a very specific kind of equity breakout of, you know, who's in the GP and how much they're contributing. And we want to balance that against uh, fees up front. Um, you know, we just want to make sure that the sponsor maintains um, enough positive net equity in the deal to where they're not, uh, you know, disincentivized because because they don't have anything in it. Right. So if, you know, they're taking a two percent act fee and they're syndicating the GP, it's like, all right, well, maybe you need to dump in something close to 20 percent just to make sure that you know we're all on the same page, so to speak. Um, as far as track record, things like that. Um, 
there, there's not really a number that we look for in terms of AUM or historical performance or unit count or whatever. It's more just like, you know, ha have you done this before in this market, this asset class, this business plan, you know, any exit or full cycle investments is, is icing on the cake. But um, you just, we, we just want to make sure that, um, you know, somebody knows what they're doing, where they're doing it. Where are you getting the most of your deal flow directly? Or are you working with brokers? Uh, how do you, how do you guys source your deals right now? It's a good question. I would, uh, I feel like we should probably get the data together on that, figure out where to focus some more marketing effort. But um, my best guess would probably be about half and half in terms of things that we actually execute on. Um, you know, we, we, we get a lot of inbound deal flow, but, um, you know, you get quite a bit of, of, of Looney Tunes, so to speak. Um, you know, folks that are asking for a fix and flip for a couple houses or something like that. Um, so in, in, in terms of ex executable deals, it, it, it is nice when it comes from a broker typically because they know what private equity providers are looking for. So it's in a digestible, standardized kind of format more often than not. Um, but, but I would say, yeah, about half and half. And then, of course, we, we have our sponsors that we like quite a bit. So in an ideal world, we just have a great stable of sponsors that are feeding us deals constantly that we know and trust and, and, and things like that. Yeah, that makes sense. And then what, what's the expectation of like loan volume growth? or you know, total deal growth that you are experiencing and you expect to experience over the next few years? Few years, I can't really say. Um, you know, Last year we did about 115 million in total volume across, I don't know, I gotta think like 30 or so transactions roughly. Um, so yeah, the, the target this year on the billboard was, was uh, $300 million. Um, we are off to a pretty strong start. Uh, I think we had like a $40 million uh, Q1 and uh, April of, of, of this year was, was pretty monumental. We've got a couple of other very big closings coming up this month. So um, we're on the right track, but it's, it's going to take a, take a serious effort from a lot of folks. And, you know, really, I think what is, it, we, we just need more, more demand on the platform, right? Like we need more investors um, and we just need to be able to make sure that these targets uh, that we're trying to hit, we can hit from a demand perspective because, you know, good deals are, are, are definitely out there. Um, and I've, I've, I've got a great team and we've spent a lot of time building a, a pipeline of uh, pretty high quality sponsors and, and transactions. So um, in an ideal world, we can do all of them. You know, what, what does the approval process typically look like? You get a, you know, an overview executive summary loan package. Uh, you, you, you know, you're intrigued. You kind of ask for some conditions. Do you, what's the committee look like? Is it just the two principles at the end of the day that make the, kind of underwriting decisions? Um, yeah, so we have our two principals and also our, our, our head of real estate, who's a, who's a pretty fantastic fella. Um, he, he, uh, and a couple of other folks basically built the, uh, the safe old ground lease business over at iStar. Um, so they're, they're our investment committee, but it's, it's all a pretty collaborative process. So our, our real estate and deal team is, is uh, probably 15 people and we all you know jump on an investment committee call um, twice a week and run through new deals. Um, the, from a from a process perspective, you know, typically what it looks like is I'll get a deal in the door, <clears throat> as you mentioned, like an OM financial model, senior debt term sheet if it's available. I'm going to give it the once over. Um, uh, you know, I'd say 95% of the time, it's 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 probably um, not not a great fit for a couple of reasons. Um, and then uh, you know, it kind of uh, kind of starts to work through the system a little bit. So we have like these little uh, like deal meetings that we take twice a week just to talk over new stuff, like what's interesting, what's not so interesting. And once it gets a green light from there, our underwriters dig into it. Um, I would say back to front from the day that I get the deal to the day that it's, you know, fully investment committee approved is you know, probably two, two and a half weeks. Um, so it's, it's, it's very collaborative. We meet very frequently, um, you know, just trying to keep the pipeline open. So you guys can move fairly quickly on closings if it was a kind of a, bridge deal and you know they needed to close and that was a decent asset without having to put a lot of you know too much thought into it you guys can move close in three or four weeks yeah and on, on the bridge that side of things you know we we have our third parties uh kind of vendors that we certainly like to use and um, as i mentioned we have some kind of discretionary capital that we can pull from to uh, to kind of close on on balance sheet if we need to so you know, it's, it's not predicated on the success or the failure or the timing of, of the capital raise. Um, you know, really, we can close as fast as we can wrap up diligence and, and, and the legal process. On, on like multifamily bridge debt, do you get, will you guys do holdbacks for CapEx and things like that? Are you or not geared that you're just going to basically put a senior loan on and no holdbacks? Um, for, from an operational perspective, we can, um, you know, we can we can manage a draw process um, or, a, or, you know, kind of like reserve withholding process. 
uh, really, we're, we, we just can't get competitive on, on multifamily, right? Um, these days, it's, it's just, you know, you got 80% of cost bridge debt in the um, you know, like low fours. It's like, you know, what are we going to do there? Um, yeah. And the other and the other multifamily deals that you could be competitive on are probably too small, like a million or two million dollar deals. Yeah, you know, um, it's it's if just from a from a kind of hit rate and probability perspective, we're just better off, I think, focusing on other asset classes from a from a senior debt perspective. All right, do you guys have uh, any hospitality, or is hospitality something you often pass on? Um, actually, we just closed on our first hotel deal. Um, uh, in March, uh, since, since COVID. Um, and to be fair, it was, it was a pretty, pretty easy. Yes. Uh, it was you know, a nice little, uh, 90 key, uh, boutique hotel, um, in South beach, South of fifth, uh, which is, you know, the, the kind of top tier sub market on, on Miami beach. Um, so we were LP equity there. Um, great, great little deal. Um, it was like, we bought it like right. Our, 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 our sponsor closed on it right during spring break. So they were at, you know, like full occupancy for a month. Um, you know, just, um, slamming records on the ADR side of things. Um, and, uh, that was an interesting one too, because it was, um, it was, uh, an Argentinian development group that basically was uh, just kind of like a fix and flip boutique hotel group. Um, you know, not necessarily professional operators, but, uh, you know, they re they, they renovated uh, this hotel that we purchased in 2016. They built a new one in, like right across the street, um, that fit completely in 2019. And then they had another one just like a block over. So, as a condition of, of this contract, our, our sponsor was able to um, get a right of first refusal on those other two hotels. So, you know, this, this hotel works very well on its own, but in an ideal world, they're going to close down the other three. There's going to be amenity sharing and beach pass sharing and they each have their own um, kind of restaurant and retail. Um, so it's, it was, it was, it was a great little kind of block to just get involved in. Um, but yeah. They, so, uh, so, so that structure was, there was some kind of bridge debt, and then, and then uh, they brought in, they, they raised X amount of capital and then, then your group uh, provided some LP uh, infusion as well. Is that kind of the structure? Yeah, so if I remember correctly, they brought in, um, the sponsor co-investment was like two and a half million. We put in seven million or so. They had a uh, repeat kind of family office out of Brazil uh, put in another three million or so. Um, and the kind of spattering to, or spattering to different folks to, to fill the rest and, um, the, uh, you know, very, very attractive senior debt, you know, like 60% of cost and very reasonable interest rate. So that was, um, that was, that was just a good deal across the board. It was a kind of good one to get back involved with hospitality. Good, good, good. Well, thank you for all this insight guys. And, uh, this is equity multiple Henry post here. He's the capital markets director. Um, and, and they, they seem to kind of fill a void in the, in the full capital stack and it seems like they're growing substantially and appreciate your time. Uh, where's the best place for people to, to follow you at Henry? Oh, um, LinkedIn's probably good. Uh, again, okay. my name's Henry post pretty, pretty easily followable. I'm, uh, I'm not trendy enough to, to have a Twitter yet, but you know, I'll work on it, I guess. Um, and then, uh, if you just want to check out some more information, feel free to visit our website, uh, equitymultiple.com. There's a raise capital page that kind of gives a breakout of, of our different um, uh, kind of investment verticals, LP or joint venture equity, preferred equity, bridge debt. Um, and of course, if you just want to reach out to me, I'm happy to certainly happy to answer any questions. Awesome. This is great. This is really cool. I love learning different pieces of the puzzle to get these deals done. And thank you for your time. And I hope everybody out there learned a little bit more about how the capital stack deals work and uh, how these developers and sponsors are getting their, their deals done. So we'll see you on the next episode. All right. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.